This is FRM part two, book one, Market Risk Measurement and Management, and the chapter on the art of term structure models, volatility and distribution. Let me give you just a quick reminder of what we did in the previous chapter. We examined a handful of models in which we were assuming constant volatility in order to try to predict some kind of a term structure. Let me also just quickly remind you that what we're essentially doing here is trying to figure out what that term structure looks like. I mean, let's face it, we can, we can easily draw a yield curve, which explains the relationship between time to maturity and yield to maturity, just by simply looking at treasury yields from you know one month all the way out to 30 years. And so we can look at, it's probably gonna be an upward slope most of the time. We can also draw a yield curve for you know, investment grade bonds or distressed bonds, but mostly we look at the yield curve for risk-free securities because that risk-free term structure serves as the beginning point for lots of models that we talk about in risk management, not least of which is that capital asset pricing model. And of course the CAPM relies on beta. And let me just tell you a quick story here about how this chapter is so important I remember being in graduate school and uh, using lots and lots of different software packages to estimate beta. And my professors kept saying, you know, we need to worry about the stability of beta and the stability of beta. And I kept wondering, okay, why is that an important part of our risk management analysis? And it dawned on me that you can compute beta over kind of any time interval from a week or a month or a year. And that beta estimate is going to be dependent on that time frame. And so the stability of beta in that capital asset pricing model is a big concern. And so the stability in those term structure models that we looked at in the previous chapter, you know, that that's uh, that possibly can enter into our equation, you know, some kind of inconsistencies or maybe some uh, variables that we don't like from an economic or a fundamental analysis standpoint. So what we're going to do is we're going to, in this chapter, examine those models and we're going to add a variable or two to those models that consider time dependent volatility. All right, thanks for your patience on that uh, on that introduction. So here are the learning objectives. And these look an awful lot like the learning objectives from the previous chapter. We are going to do a couple of calculations. And I have a, a really nice table uh, towards the end of the slide deck that's really going to summarize that Cox and Ingersoll Ross model. But look at that first learning objective. Describe the short term rate process, which we did in that last chapter, under a model with time dependent volatility. So that's pretty much the overarching learning objective that we're going to look at in this chapter. And then we'll do a host of other things with uh, time dependent volatility models and then uh, some short slides on basis point volatility and log normal mo models at the end of the slide deck. All right, here's a slide that we can do very, very quickly. This is just a reminder of what I was saying earlier and then what we did in that last chapter. And so just quickly here, let me read those circle points. So model one had constant volatility, but no drift. Model two had constant volatil volatility, but some drift. And we had, a, we had a constant drift. Remember, it was that lambda term. Then we had constant volatility in the ho Lee model, but we had a time-dependent drift. And then we, uh, we looked at the Vasicek model, which had constant volatility and a mean reverting drift. So what's similar and, in fact, identical in those models from the last chapter is that constant volatility. So we're introducing a model that has time-dependent volatility. All right, let's look at uh, short term rate process under a model with time dependent volatility. And before we get into some of the details here, look at the look at the two equations that I have in those blue boxes in the middle. What I've done in that first top box is highlighted in red that very first model that we talked about at the beginning of the last chapter. So on the left hand side of the equal sign, we have the change in that short term rate and you know, I tried to highlight and gray out all those other variables that we're going to look at in this model. So forget about those and just look at the red. So we have the change in the short term rate as a function of volatility. And then that 
random variable uh, that we talked about during during the last chapter. So what we're doing in this chapter is I'm I'm unshading all of those variables, and then that second equation is uh, contains what we did in the previous chapter in that first model. But then we're going to look at some extra variables. So we've got a time dependent volatility function where we still have that lambda that's dependent on time. And then over there to the right of the plus sign, we have the volatility, which is also dependent on time. Now, one of the cool things about using this model is that we can use this to fit some uh, bond pricing models. We can also use this model to determine swap rates and we can even use this model to examine and price uh, options. So if you look below the two equation blocks, I've just kind of summarized that there uh, in words. Now let's take a quick look at this model three. We're going to call this a special case of time dependent volatility which can be represented, represented in the following equation in, in that blue box there. We're still looking at for that change in short-term rates. We're still going to have that time-dependent lambda or the drift term. And then what we're going to do is in this special case, we are going to assume that the volatility starts at some constant level. Let's pick a number. 20% or 40%, and then we're going to exponentially decline that to zero. So that's what that graph kind of shows you there. We're going to we're going to take e raised to the minus alpha times t, which is time, of course, in this case, and we're going to pick an alpha that's constant, and that alpha is going to depend on how quickly or how much of a steep or flat downward slope we want our volatility to decline to zero. Just look at that e to the minus alpha t. Think of that in terms of really kind of taking a present value. So you're kind of discounting the volatility. You know, just say it's 10% and you're discounting it. Well, let's just do a linear one, you know, 10% then 9 to 8 to 7 to 6, all, all the way down to zero. But we want it to exponentially decline to zero. So we'll, we'll pick a constant there that gets us some kind of a slope that we're comfortable with uh, you know, fundamentally or economically or, you know, some kind of a pricing uh, model that makes sense. So here's here's a quick example. Let's suppose we have that short term rate. We begin with 3%. We've got a drift of 0.24%. And then we're going to have annual uh, volatility with an initial standard deviation of 1.3%. And there, notice in the uh, exponent we picked a uh, we picked an alpha of 0.3 that could be 0.25 i think in the in the uh, in the textbook they use an example of 0.025 it could be really any number and then there's that random variable down there the dw 0.2 so look at the question over there at the top right determine the change in the short term rate after one month so you can quickly go through the math there feel free as i always say to pause the video and verify that math and so we start at three percent and then we're going to go up after one month this model three is going to predict a 3.27 percent short term rate after after one month and then by way of, you know, kind of discussion and explanation, what I've done down in those circle points at the bottom is I have substituted some different numbers for time, you know, 0, 5, and 10. could be any number. And so look at, look at those estimates for volatility. We go from 1 down to 0.05 or so. So you can see how with the 0.3, we're going we're gonna to get to 0 after, well, we're not getting to zero after 10 months, but we're getting closer, much closer to zero after that time period. All right, how about a time-dependent volatility model uh, that produces some kind of a result that we like? That's the, what that word efficacy means. And this is really taken, this slide is really taken right out of the chapter. And it's really, really interesting because what we're going to do is we're trying to come up with this term structure model in which we have some use to price fixed income options 
And these things work really, really well when the market price is not easily observable. You know, it's one thing to use the Black Scholes Merton option pricing model to determine the call price on an Amazon option, right? We can easily observe those stock prices every single day and all of those variables. But suppose that we want to we want to sell an option on a distressed security that trades every three months or every two months or every sometime period. And so we have some known prices where we can actually see those trades. And then, then we have some unknown prices where we can't see those trades. And so this is really useful for that kind of a scenario. Um, uh, however, if the purpose of the model is to value fixed income securities and use that valuation model to hedge fix come those fixed income securities, then we're probably going to want to use a model with mean reversion. And we've talked at length about mean reversion. And let me just remind you, I used the uh, golf example a couple of chapters ago, a couple of videos ago in which I use the Tiger Woods shooting 61 and 60 or something on a Thursday, Friday. Can you reasonably expect him to shoot a 61 and a 60 over the weekend? And the answer is probably not because he's going to revert to his mean athletic production. And so we have that same kind of thing here with uh, with these term structure models because we have time dependent volatility that is going to change over time. And so what might be relevant, you know, a couple of days ago might not be relevant moving forward to tomorrow. And then, of course, we need to worry about uh, we need to worry about non parallel shifts in the yield curve. And so that uh, those models that have mean reversion and we'll see that with the, the Cox Ingersoll Ross model here in just a few seconds. Uh, this is one of the cool, coolest things I ever teach my students in the derivative securities class is uh, is not only working through the mechanics of options on interest rates, these caplets and floorlets, but you can use these time dependent volatility models to price these kinds of derivatives. And so in a caplet and in a floorlet, really, really, the buyer is just going to receive a payment that's either above or below some agreed exercise price or exercise rate. It's really kind of a simple model, but but it's dependent on interest rates. And so we need to really worry about what's going to happen with that term structure. Now, the problem with these multi-period derivatives is that, boy, suppose we had a 40 year caplet, which, of course, those things don't exist. But we're trying to estimate that volatility way out into the future. And wow, as I've said to you many, many times, it's really, really difficult to predict interest rates in the short term, uh, let alone the long term. And then it's even more complex to try to predict volatility far out into the future. And that brings us to this CIR model, which was developed you know, 30 years ago or so in response to the testing of these earlier models, which clearly uh, had some variable that was that was missing. Um, let me just remind you, we, we talked about that simple option pricing model that had four variables that were used to estimate the price of a call option. And that simple option pricing model missed out on on volatility. And so that's what Black Scholes Merton did is they uh, they incorporated that fifth variable to get a model that not only was accurate or at least reasonably accurate during certain circumstances, but also uh, gained attention uh, in, in the Nobel Prize world. And so that's what Cox Ingersoll Ross are trying to do here is to use this concept of mean reversion and apply it to the term structure. And so really, quite simply, from a big picture standpoint, this CIR model is, is essentially the Vasicek model with mean reversion added to it. And so look, look there inside of the equation I have. What color is that? Orange. And so we have a couple of other estimates in a couple of other variables, the K, the theta. And then notice on that far right side, 
we're going to add the square root of the level of the interest rate, which is going to preclude the possibility of negative interest rates. And that's really, really important. Let's work through a couple of example slides here, just a quick one, and then I have a big table on the next slide. So let's go ahead and start out with a 6% initial short-term rate. And then we have that long run rate, 20%. So we're gonna revert to the mean. So boy, we have a long way to go here from 6% all the way up to 20%. There's that K.05. Remember in the last video, I asked you to think about either an Olympic sprinter or me running 100 meters. So we have a relatively low mean reversion adjustment. 1.3% uh, volatility. And then we're gonna do this over one month. So there's the 0.08. Three, three. So the question is determine the change in the short term rate after one month. So we're going to do the same thing that we did just a couple of slides ago. And that takes us through the learning objective to calculate, calculate using model three, which we did calculate using the CIR model, which which we're doing right here. Once again, feel free to stop the slide and verify all the math right there. But notice what we're doing. We're starting at 6% and then we're going to end up at 6.122% there's that change of 0.122% using the math of the CIR model. And so you can see how cool this model is that we're going to impose on the model a condition in which we're going to start at six and then move up to our long run average rate of 20%. So we're gonna to move to that 20 and we're gonna do it in a random sense because remember there's still uh, there's still a dw in there uh, which we had as uh, 0.2 so let's go ahead and look at this uh, look at this table so we're going to go from month zero all the way out to month seven there is time and those fractions of time they're truncated in just two decimal points and then you can easily calculate that mean reverting drift term. And then there's the column of the random variable. I showed you guys in that last, uh, in that last chapter how you can use Excel to come up with those uh, random numbers. And remember, they're going to act you know, kind of like probabilities. So they're going to be uh, either on the slightly positive side or the slightly negative side. Notice there are two negatives in there for month four and five. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna translate to a decrease in, in that monthly interest rate. And so the next column, you can go ahead and calculate that. And then there's the DR, so that cooks. So let me just go back here. Let me go back, there's the model right there. So at the top of that Excel spreadsheet, there's that formula, and then there's the DR column. And then the far right column is just uh, the 6% plus that change. So we go from six, and then let me just go through these quickly. Then we go to 612 and 634, then up to 644, but then, but then down to 634, down to 625, and then back up and up again. And so note that after seven months, we're slowly, right? We're slowly getting to that 20%. We're really slowly getting to that 20%. Now, the chapter does talk about some other popular models here. There's really not a clear learning objective here, but let's just go through these pretty quickly here. The Cortadon model and then the log normal model or model four. And what these things do is these things look at uh, basis point volatility uh, that is incorporated in this change in the short term rate. So I would just remember that point for the exam. Now there are explicit learning objectives for log normal models. So let's look at one with a, with a deterministic drift term. And this goes back to the 1980s when I was, in, when I was even an undergraduate in the early 1980s by, by Solomon Brothers. And notice what's happening here. We're, we're just gonna, instead of dr to the left of the equal sign, we're gonna take the change in the natural log of that interest rate. And on the right-hand side of the equal sign, it's going to be something similar to what we've done before. It's really not that big of a change. And then we can put together some kind of an interest rate tree in which we're going to impose that model 50% up and 50% down. And so this is really no different 
than, than what we've done before in a couple of those previous chapters. But what we can do is that we can derive this tree by taking the exponent of each node. And what that does is kind of simplify it for us. Uh, just remember that, uh, look in the very middle there, I have in parentheses, recall that when you raise e to the natural log of x, you get x. So that means that the natural log of that current short term rate that comes out to the beginning, that comes out to the beginning of the model. So we have, you know, let's just look at those first two nodes. You start with the short term rate today, r sub zero. And then what you're doing is you're going to go up uh, r sub o e to the, you know, there's that log normal model. And then we're going to plus the volatility or minus the volatility. And that's going to lead us to no negative short rates. What we can do is we can add the mean reverting process into this log normal model. This is the black Karasinski model. And what this allows us to do is that it allows that uh, volatility, mean reversion and central tendency are all allowed to depend on time. So if you look in that model there, there's a bunch of T's in there. So that illustrates the reliance on time. Let me just remind you that that equation there implies that the natural log of the short term rate is normally distributed. And then here's our interest rate tree with the log normal model and mean reversion. And so what we're going to do is just simply here, let me go back here, simply use this model to form that interest rate tree. And here's just a quick summary of what we've done in this chapter. We started with that special case model three, and then we added mean reversion, and then we added that long log normal distribution. And so just think of those, just think of these models as, you know, we're starting at that short rate today. What was that number in our examples? One, one was 3% and one was 6%. And we're trying to go out you know, like this, we're trying to go out like this and we're trying to figure out what are some important input variables to determine what those future interest rates are going to be. And so we come up with all these uh, input variables and I think they work reasonably well for some derivatives and for other securities and they don't work reasonably well for others. And I think that takes us through our learning objectives.